Many times in the comments, I've been told, and you've probably seen, but that's a weak hadith, as if that somehow means that that is an inauthentic hadith that cannot be relied upon, that cannot be trusted. What I'm going to do is a very quick video, again, but I'm going to discuss just the critical aspects of these hadith, how they are graded, and how reliable they are, and what is the Islamic scholarly consensus, the actual official Islamic position on these hadith. What I'm looking at here is the book, The Reliance of the Traveler. This, of course, is the most reliable, the most trusted Islamic Sharia manual. Notice this says here, the Prophet said, seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every Muslim. The meaning of this hadith, though the hadith itself is not well authenticated, a being weak is true. Now, as you know, hadith are graded. You have the Sahih, you have the Hassan, the strong, and then you have Da'if, and of course you've got the fourth grade, which is the known false hadith. False hadith are categorized, they are known, they are collected together, they are all identified. Da'if means weak. This is a weak hadith, Da'if, but it is used in the Sharia, and it is undoubtedly true. Now I'm going to get to the clincher later, but I want to show that this weak hadith are actually used in the Sharia, and they are relied upon, and they are regarded as true. Now, next piece of evidence. If you take a copy, and again, I will link to these copies of the Reliance of the Traveler so you can read the Sharia manual for yourself. Search for the word Hadith. See how often this word here appears. It is an enormous number of times. Now, in Book P, which is Enormities, they discuss Hadith forgeries as Section P 9.4 and Weak Hadith, which is the Da'if and that Section P 9.5. This is P 9.4 right here. And this is from Ibn Kathir, who is possibly the most authentic, the most highly regarded tafsir author in Islam. As for detecting forged hadith, there are many signs that enable one to do so, such as internal evidence of forgery in wording or context, including poor grammar, corrupt meaning, the mention of incredible rewards for inconsiderable efforts or inconsistency with what is established in the Quran, and rigorously authenticated sahih hadith. It is not permissible for anyone to relate such a hadith except by way of condemning it, to warn one of the ignorant public or common people who might be deceived by it. There are many types of individuals who forge hadiths, including those who corrupt convictions about basic tenets of Islamic faith, as well as devotees who believe they are doing good by making up hadith-like stories that encourage others to do good, avoid bad, or perform meritorious acts. That such stories may be acted upon Right, so these thoughts are informed by other scholars, and the scholars routinely refer to other works and other scholars. Let's look at section P, 9.5. Having discussed lies and forgeries, we must strictly distinguish them from the hadith category called not well authenticated or da'if, literally meaning weak. So termed because of such factors as having a channel of transmission containing a narrator whose memory was poor, one who was unreliable, unidentified by name or for other reasons. Such hadiths legally differ from forgeries in the permissibility of ascribing them to the Prophet, and in other ways discussed at W48 below. We must note that words like permissibility are legal terms in the Sharia They have a specific meaning. These are legal texts, and these are effectively lawyers, and they are using legal terminology. These may not be utilized in the colloquial way that we would use them as normal speech. Section W48 does not exist in this manual. We will have to switch to the poorly scanned version of the Sharia, of this particular Sharia manual, which is the Umdat al salik Let me move on and provide additional evidence before we move to the rock-solid piece that I want to show you. This is the scanned version of the original, and we can see this line here. The meaning of this hadith, though the hadith itself is not well authenticated, is true. Right? It is known as being a weak hadith, and you can see the original Arabic in this column on the right here. But let us go on and show you some more. Now we have a quick look in the index, and this says weak da'if hadiths, defined in section 022, not considered lies. This is section P 9.5, and use of as legal evidence is covered in section W48. So weak hadith are specifically defined in the Sharia. Weak hadith are not considered lies as specifically mentioned in this index in the Sharia and used as legal evidence as defined in section W48. So of course, let's go have a look at section W48. 
So now we turn to the rarely seen chapter W or appendix W of the Reliance of the Traveler. Note a couple of pages are missing. This ends at 953 and we are beginning on page 955. So what we have here is section W48.3 and I want to read this. So understand, this again is coming from the most common, most authentic, most trusted Hadith manual. After this, we will provide a lot more clarity as well. Thus, when the person who has related a hadith is an Islamic scholar of the first rank, it is not enough for a student or popular writer to find one chain of transmission for the hadith that is weak. There are a great many hadiths with several chains of transmission. An adequate scholarly treatment of how these affect a hadith's authenticity has been traditionally held to require a master, a hafiz, those like Bukhari, Muslim, Tahabi, Ibn Kathir or Siyuti, who have memorized at least 100,000 hadiths their texts, chains of transmission, and significance to undertake the comparative study of the Hadith's various chains of transmission that cannot be accurately assessed without such knowledge. Today, when not one Hadith master Hafiz remains in the Muslim community, we do not accept the judgment of any would-be reclassifiers of Hadith, no matter how large their popular following, unless it is corroborated by the work of previous Hadith masters. That was from section W. 48.2 and now section W 48.3. Another reason why weak cannot simply be equated with false is the fact that weak is an attribute of the hadith's chain of transmission, while false is an attribute of the hadith's text. So when John Q. Muslim tells you that's a weak hadith, he's really trying to deceive you because False is an attribute of the actual content. Weak is simply the fact that you cannot necessarily strictly verify the chain of transmission. It does not refer to the actual content, the actual text of the Hadith. These are two different things, and the relationship between their respective reliabilities is a probabilistic expectation. Now, this is the official scholarly view. Let's have a look at my final reference from this book. Even if these hadiths are unauthenticated in their chains of transmission, since virtually all scholars have related them, the hadith's authenticity which they accept eliminates their need to verify the channels of transmission. And so it is too with the hadith of Mu'ad, the fact that all scholars have adduced it as evidence eliminates the needs for their checking its means of transmission. So John Q. Liar in the comments is ignorant or lying to you. If he knows this, he's lying to you. And if he doesn't know this, then he's an ignorant idiot. He shouldn't be commenting and you should shut him down. It says here the scholars are fine with the fact that they don't necessarily have, because all the scholars have reached the consensus, thus they don't necessarily need every last step in the chain of transmission. Scholars have received it with acceptance. So if the scholars accept it, then fine. Um, John Q. Lying Muslim in the comments is not a scholar. His opinion holds no weight. Among the primary textual evidence for the admissibility of such hadiths is the word of the Prophet Muhammad himself. Allah will never make my community concur upon misguidance and Allah's hand is over the group. The next time one of these people tries to lie to you, show them this. Quote this to them, copy and paste this to them. This needs to start chatting them on Facebook, copy and paste. Simply show them, this is from your Sharia. Their word does not overrule the Sharia. So it is inadequate for someone who proposes to annul a ruling of sacred law to adduce that the hadith supporting it has a weak chain of transmission unless he can also establish both that there are not a number of similar variants or alternate channels of transmission that strengthen it, confirming this by means of a text by a hadith master, Hafiz, and that the meaning of the hadith has not been received with acceptance by the scholars of the Muslim community. I hope that makes this very clear. Now to describe something that has been missing from our understanding of hadith and hopefully this will clarify what you need to know, what is critical for you to know about hadith and A how you've been deceived and B how you need to understand them and how you need to rebut all the false claims that are being made by John Q. Lying Muslim in the comments this is what you need. This is called the Fat al-Bari. It's a tafsir on Sahih Bukhari and it contains just a few passages I want to bring to you Imam Bukhari's Sahih is one of the most important works in Hadith literature. Its importance may be gauged by the fact that at least 70 full commentaries have been written on the Sahih. As you know, there are grades of Hadith, Sahih, Hassan, Da'if, and Maudu. So you have your authentic, your strong, your weak, 
and your false, your known false hadith. They're all known. There is no confusion about what these are. Well, maybe a little bit, but we'll discuss that as we go. The most important of all hadith collections is, of course, the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari. Al-Bukhari weighed every word he wrote with scrupulous accuracy. He devoted more than a quarter of his life to the compilation of his Sahih. It is considered by Muslims as an authority second only to the Quran. Interesting. So very often I will hear, well, that's not the Quran, or that's only the Hadith and it's Mos uh, whatever, whatever. This thing holds authority. Now I'm going to skip forward, page 5 of this. Al-Bukhari's notion to compile the Sahih owed its origin to a casual remark from Isaac bin Raweha, however you pronounce that, who said that he wished that a Hadith scholar would compile a short but comprehensive book containing the genuine a Hadith only. Bukhari sifted through all the known Hadith, tested their genuineness according to canons of criticism he himself developed. He selected 7,275 out of some 600,000 hadith and arranged them according to their subject matter under separate headings, most of which are taken from the Quran and in some cases from the hadith themselves. Now skipping forward to the final section, let's look at the methodology of the translators. The translation of the hadith was done by students of knowledge studying both Medina Munawara and Egypt at Al-Azhar. This is the methodology they employed in translating the hadith from Fat al-Bari. We will be translating the meaning of the explanation rather than translating the explanation verbatim. We will exclude anything that we deem irrelevant for the English reader. Narrations that Ibn Hajar himself classifies as weak will be removed from the translation. It should be noted that this was at the discretion of the students at Medina Removing weak ahadith from works was not the example of the scholars. Otherwise, Imam Ibn Hajar would not have included them himself in Fat al-Bari as sources to take knowledge from. And this is critical here. Weak hadith are used to support opinions because a weak hadith containing the words of the Prophet is preferred over pure opinion and personal ijtihad, personal judgment. And this is the example set by all the scholars, including Imam Bukhari himself who used them deliberately in his works, Al-Adab Al-Mufrad. The Sahih of Imam Bukhari is a collection of the Sahih Ahadith specifically. It is not a collection of the only Hadith that scholars should use. The scholars themselves state a Sahih Hadith has about a 99 to 100% chance of being entirely accurate. A Hassan Hadith has about an 85 to 99% chance of being entirely accurate. A Da'if Hadith has about a 45 to 85 percent chance of being entirely accurate. And this is the widest band of accuracy. Even a fabricated Hadith, that is the Maudu Hadith, has a 0 to 45 percent chance of being accurate, since the grading it was given may have been wrong or the fabricator may have spoken the truth in this instance. So weak Hadith should not be treated like fabricated Hadith because an 85 percent chance of being entirely accurate is a very high chance. If a person received 85% on his test scores, would he throw that out, saying that isn't worth anything? Each hadith is treated individually. There is no such thing in Islam as banning an entire grade of ahadiths from being used. Even fabricated hadith are still studied, because one scholar may grade it fabricated, while another may grade it sahih. And there are many famous examples among the scholars of this occurring. So, my final entries, and I will end off here. So, they will rely on M. Muhsin Khan's translation of the actual hadith in Bukhari. Often I've seen quotes from people in comments saying, Muhsin Khan, his, his Quran can't be trusted because he wasn't a reliable translator. Oh, okay, fine, sure, whatever. Any questions surrounding the explanation of the hadith will be presented to the scholars in Egypt and Saudi Arabia. So, that would be Medina and Al-Azhar University. And... That establishes their authenticity. Right, that's me. I hope this was helpful and thank you.